talk about how to derive the governing differential equations for describing the motion of a dynamic system. In the last class, I have introduced the concept of generalized coordinates or generalized displacements. So, we are going to use uh, this particular uh, symbol. Okay. So, we are going to use this symbol QK to describe the generalized coordinates or generalized displacements. So, k over here can take values of 1 to n. So, that means that there are n number of degrees of freedom in a system. Now, these degrees of freedom describe the configuration of the system. They describe the configuration of the system. Now, once we go through some examples, it will become clear as to uh, things will become clear. Now, the governing differential equations are going to be in terms of QK with appropriate initial or boundary conditions. Now, the main principle which we are going to use in order to derive the governing differential equations would be the Hamiltonian principle. Now, the, mo uh, the Hamiltonian principle. So, Hamiltonian principle is written in uh, multiple forms. So, in today's lecture, I am going to introduce to you the Hamiltonian principle in two, three different forms. Okay. So, the Hamiltonian principle states that integral time integral of the variation of the kinetic energy minus the potential energy of the system minus summation of generalized forces QK times the variation in the corresponding generalized displacement QK integrated over the time dt would be equal to 0 for the solution to the problem. Okay. So, uh, in the Hamiltonian principle, whatever I have said in uh, words, it is written over here. So, kinetic T denotes the kinetic energy. Now, typically, kinetic energy is only a function of the rate form of the generalized displacement. So, for example, if you have a mass and if you are looking at its kinetic energy only from translation, then it would be half times m times x dot square plus y dot square plus z dot square, where x, y and z denote the position of the point, okay, x coordinate, y coordinate and z coordinate of the point mass. So, most of the times kinetic energy is only a function of the rate of change of these generalized displacements, but fine, for maths purposes we are saying that, okay, let kinetic energy be a function of position as well as the rate of change of the generalized displacement. Then U denotes the potential energy from conservative forces. Now, take for example, a spring mass damper system, okay? a very simple spring mass damper system, which I am going to show you in the next few slides. Now, if you take the spring mass system, there are going to be multiple forces, which are going to be generated within the system. So, what will be the different forces that you are going to encounter in the spring mass system? When we are looking at vibration of a mass which is connected to a spring and a damper in parallel, what are the different forces which would be exerted on the mass? Sorry, spring forces, uh, damping forces and inertial forces. 
there is also gravitational force okay if the mass is vibrating in the vertical direction then you also have a gravitational force now if you take the spring force and the gravitational force uh, would they be conservative forces or non conservative forces what do we mean by a conservative force conservative force means it is a force uh, conservative force means that if you move this particular force along a closed path then the integral of the f bar dotted with ds bar over a closed integral will always be equal to zero or in other words this particular force can be written as a this can be written as divergence of some scalar function okay so the spring force and the gravitational force are conservative forces whereas if you look at uh, the force exerted by the damper what kind of a force would that be is that a conservative force no that is not a conservative force another way to look at the forces is are you storing the energy or are you dissipating the energy so forces like the frictional force and force exerted by the damper these are non conservative forces the spring force gravitational force as well as uh, the elastic deformation uh, particularly linear elastic or hyper elastic deformation in the material these are all conservative forces okay so u over here denotes potential energy coming from conservative forces and potential energy by itself by definition what is it equal to so normally it contains two parts what is it it will be equal to the stored energy or the strain energy minus the external work once again external work from the conservative forces okay and now what is qk capital qk denotes generalized force associated with non conservative action so for example so you are dealing with dissipative media and qk can be defined as equal to partial derivative of f dot where f dot is the total energy dissipated per unit time within the system so we are taking f dot to be a function of q dot p okay so if you take a linear damper then the dissipation energy will be equal to half times c times x dot square okay if you take frictional work or frictional power it will be equal to frictional force multiplied by the sliding velocity okay so normally the dissipation is a function of this uh, um, time derivative of the generalized displacement so qk is simply equal to the partial derivative of f dot with respect to q dot k okay so uh, now one of what is uh, one of the major benefits of using the hamiltonian principle as opposed to using force balance moment balance uh, is that you get to deal with scalar functions which are easy to easy to derive okay so whenever you are dealing with vectors and tensors you need to be really careful about the choice of your coordinate system and a variety of things and uh, a variety of things whereas as far as energy is concerned energy doesn't depend on the choice of coordinate system and and most of the times deriving expressions whether it is for kinetic energy potential energy or the dissipation energy is a relatively straightforward thing to do so hamiltonian principle allows us 
to use these expressions for kinetic energy, potential energy and dissipation energy in order to derive the governing differential equations for generalized displacements. Okay. Now, uh, before we move on, uh, in the Hamiltonian principle, you, you have seen an integral which goes from T1 to T2. One important point related to the Hamiltonian principle is that we assume that the system configuration is known at times T1 and T2. By system configuration, we mean the geometric configuration of the system is known at times T1 and T2. Now, most of the times when we are applying this particular principle, we can take time T1 to be the initial condition which is known and time T2 to be a large enough time where the system stops vibrating and comes to some equilibrium configuration which is known to us. So, in this sense, in a real situation, it is uh, pretty reasonable to assume that we would know the system configuration at times T1 and T2. Now, as I had said earlier, Hamiltonian principle is written in multiple forms. The original form of the Hamiltonian principle was actually not in terms of variation, but rather it was uh, stated in a different manner. So, originally Hamiltonian principle stated that the actual motion of a system characterized by, so this is an important point. So, the motion of the system is characterized by the generalized displacements Qk of T and uh, uh, it is such that the actual motion is such that the the integral i defined as integral t1 to t2 t minus u dt is stationary in comparison to admissible neighboring motions. What do we mean by that? What we mean is, so if you take, let us say, uh, if you take ad adjacent motions, so how would you define adjacent motions? Adjacent motions are defined as q star k of t is equal to is equal to q k of t ok this is the solution to the problem plus a scalar variable epsilon multiplied by multiplied by eta k of t ok. So, when we are talking about admissible neighboring motions. So, for neighboring motions, ok, for neighboring, uh, so, huh, so, for immediately adjacent motion limit uh, epsilon will be small, ok. So, epsilon will be small. So, variation of q k will be equal to, variation of q k will be equal to uh, epsilon times eta k where epsilon is a small number ok. Now, uh, huh. so originally the Hamiltonian principle stated that variation of this integral would be equal to 0 for all admissible for all admissible variations in q k. And because q k is known at t 1 and t 2, variation of q k at t 1 and t 2 will be 0. And originally this was proposed only for conservative forces. Okay. Now, as per the original Hamiltonian principle, okay, uh, using the original Hamiltonian principle, you can, uh, you can get this Lagrange equations of motion, which is basically uh, equal to the partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to q k minus the time derivative of partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to q dot k is equal to 0 for k equals to 1 to n. So, how many equations are these? This particular statement over here, how many equations does it give you? This gives you small n number of equations. Uh, 
small n number of equations in qk and how many unknown variables are there? How many unknown variables are there? Again, you also have small n number of unknown variables. What are the variables which we are trying to solve for? What we are trying to solve for is qk as a function of time. Okay. So, what we are trying to solve for is qk as a function of time and this describes the motion of the system. Okay. So, these are the unknowns. These are the unknowns. Okay. These are called Lagrange equations of motion and you can use it whenever you are dealing with a conservative system. Okay. Now, but if you assume means if you consider the case where you do have non-conservative forces then in absence of constraints meaning whenever qk are fully independent in absence of constraints equations of motion are given by this. So, now the Lagrange equations of motion has gotten slightly modified. Now, the right hand side is equal to the generalized force qk what was qk? This was basically equal to the variation of the total energy, dis, uh, energy dissipation rate with respect to q dot k. Okay? This was the definition of qk. So, you can use this particular equation whenever you have to derive the equations of motion for a system which has conservative and non-conservative forces but the generalized displacements are all independent. They are not interlinked with one another but rather they are all independent of one another. Now, whatever I have said until now may look like a whole bunch of theory. So, you will get a good grasp of whatever I am saying only when you solve some example problem. So, let us apply this particular scheme to, let us apply this scheme to this simple problem. Okay. So, now what am I doing over here? So, in this particular problem, uh, it is a simple spring mass damper problem. I have a linear spring uh, with spring stiffness k, a linear damper with damping coefficient c, both of them are in parallel and are attached to a mass m. Initially, this system is at equilibrium. Okay? This system is at equilibrium and then after that, I am going to start to, uh, means I will displace this mass and, uh, and uh, so that I have free vibration within the system. So, what I am interested in? So, I am interested in what I am interested in free vibration. What is the other kind of vibration? So, I am saying free vibration over here. What is the other kind of vibration you can have? Forced. You can have forced vibration. So, here we are only looking at free vibration for now of the mass m about its mean position or equilibrium position. So, initially it is it is at equilibrium position at time t0. At time t0 we are uh, sorry before time t0 it is at equilibrium position. At time t0 we are uh, mm, we are disturbing it and uh, causing a certain motion within the system. Okay? So, now let us see how to derive the governing equations for this. So, uh, what all energies do you need to compute in order to compute the governing equations? So, it is very simple. You need to compute only three energies. What are the three energies that you need to compute? The kinetic energy, the potential energy and the dissipative energy. So, just these three kinetic potential and the dissipation energy 
and potential energy is the energy potential energy coming from conservative forces okay all right so let us see so what is the kinetic energy in this problem so if m is moving at what will be the velocity of the mass so displacement means uh, displacement from its mean position is being denoted by x so what will be the velocity at any time for this mass it will be x dot okay so what will be its kinetic energy half into m x dot square it's only translating it's not rotating so it's just simply half m x dot square what is the potential energy for this particular system so potential energy is stored energy minus external work so what is stored energy so initially the spring was it its mean position so initially the spring had extended by length x not now from the mean position you are displacing it by distance x so what is the total change in length of the spring it is x plus x not so what is the stored energy in the spring half k x dash square where x dash is equal to x plus x not that is the stored energy now minus external work what is external work what is the external force direction the way i have drawn okay x is in the vertical direction so what is the gravitational the gravitational force what is the magnitude of gravitational force it's positive mg. mg and it is along x direction so what will be the so let us say the equilibrium position potential energy is external work is zero okay a potential and uh, yeah means work from external force is uh, zero so what is the external work done it will be mg into x so that will be the work done by the external force and uh, so the potential energy finally will be half kx dash square minus mg x okay and what is the dissipative energy f dot equals to half c into x dot square okay uh, this much is clear anybody has any confusion on the energies front no yes, sir. yeah tell me sudhir sir uh, i think so uh, when you are uh, means uh, talking about the spring uh, means change in spring energy then it should be like uh, half uh, k x square not k dash x square but it, it is the i'm not talking about change. any change i'm not talking about change sudhir here i'm simply talking about see initially i'm computing the energies then i will obtain their variation at this stage i'm not talking about variation yet okay so this is just simply the total energy with respect to some reference okay so uh ha huh, okay so this will be uh ha huh, this thing so now now so in this problem what is the generalized coordinate generalized coordinate or generalized displacement x. x is the generalized coordinate so when i say that i am interested in obtaining the motion of this particular or uh, i am interested in getting governing equations describing the motion so what exactly am i interested in so so what i am finally interested in obtaining is x as a function of time and when i say i want governing equations for the motion i want some differential equation involving x meaning there would be some terms of x double dot x dot x and so on okay so i am interested in finally getting x of t and for that i would like to get so the governing equation is going to be in terms of x okay all right now next uh, so the generalized coordinate in this problem so you have only one degree of freedom so there is only one generalized displacement q1 which is equal to x within this problem so what is the governing differential equation now so as per the modified form of lagrange equations 
the governing equation would be uh, partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to x minus time derivative of partial derivative of Lagrangian with respect to x dot equals to partial derivative of f dot with respect to x dot. Here what is Lagrangian? It is half m x dot square minus half k x plus x naught square plus m g into x okay plus m g into x. So now so if I apply the derivative then what will I get if I take the derivative with respect to x what will I get? I will get k into x plus x naught okay I will get k into x plus x naught. So uh, huh, there is a minus sign so that is minus k x plus x naught uh, and then plus mg okay so that I get from the first term. So the first term over here gives me this then what does the second term give me minus d by dt of dl by dx dot what does it give me so dl by dx dot will be simply m into m into x dot d by dt of that will be m into x double dot there is a minus sign so it will give me minus m x double dot that is equal to df dot by dx dot this is very simple this will be equal to this term over here will be equal to c into x dot. Now if I uh, sort of uh, take mx dot to the right hand side and bring uh, cx dot to this side then what will I get mg minus k into x plus x naught plus cx dot equals to m into x double dot. Now how do I know this is correct? So what is see any time you are deriving governing equations there are all there are multiple ways of deriving the governing differential equations uh, particularly for motion so what are the different ways in which you can derive the governing differential equations of motion force balance so one is using force balance and moment balance okay so you can do that what else Next is energy methods, energy methods okay. So whatever we are doing over here, so for dynamic problems it is uh, the Hamiltonian principle, for static problems what is it? Potential. It is minimization of potential energy okay for static problems and uh, fine these are the two ways and uh, you can also use principle of virtual work. In fact the Hamiltonian principle we start with that can also be interpreted as principle of virtual work. So now for this problem can you very quickly apply the force balance method and tell me whether this differential equation is right or wrong particularly that value of x naught whether that is needed or not can you do it and tell me. it is correct now so see what do you have you have your mass okay now what are the different forces mg is acting downward and then what is acting what is the force exerted by the spring k into x, k into x plus x naught k into x plus x naught okay so it has to be the final length okay not the deviation from the mean position but that change in length from the free length position okay so it is k into x plus x naught what is the force exerted by the damper cx c into x dot okay and so what is the net force in the downward direction it will be mg minus of k into x plus x naught plus cx dot so this is the net force what will the net force be equal to Inertia. It will be equal to rate of change of linear momentum. So linear momentum in this case is mx dot rate of change of linear momentum is mx double dot okay. So you can very easily use the force balance in this particular problem 
and see that the governing equation has been obtained correctly. Uh, any questions, any doubts until here? No, okay, all right, let us continue. Now, uh, until now, we have seen how to obtain the equations of motion, uh, which is basically governing differential equations for generalized uh, displacements when all the generalized displacements are independent of one another, meaning there are no constraints, they do not depend on one another. Okay? But many times you encounter problems where the coordinates or the generalized coordinates are uh, not independent, okay? they are dependent on one another. Actually by definition generalized coordinates have to be independent of one another. Uh, but Okay, so let us say we have taken some kinematic uh, variables, but they are not independent, okay, but rather they are dependent on one another, okay. Now, what we are saying is, uh, okay, the equations which describe their interrelation is basically this alpha p. Alpha p is basically a function, a function of what? A function of generalized coordinates, okay. So, we are saying let us say that there are capital P number of constraints on the generalized displacements. Okay? So, as such the total uh, degrees of freedom we are considering is uh, n, small n, okay? but then there are capital P number of constraints on the generalized displacements. Okay? Now, on the generalized displacements. Uh, uh, just give me one second. Sorry. Now, uh, we are going to make one assumption that this function alpha, alpha p, okay, this function is going to be, huh, this function which is a function of the generalized displacements, we are going to take it to be of class C1, okay. C1 class means for these class of functions, first derivative exists and is continuous. Okay? So, you can differentiate these functions with respect to the generalized displacements. Okay? Now, uh, so for these cases, for these cases, the Hamiltonian principle is modified, the Hamiltonian principle is modified. Now, what we are going to do is, we are going to introduce Lagrange multipliers Okay, Lagrange multipliers. So, for p number of constraints, we are going to introduce p number of Lagrange multipliers. Lagrange multipliers I am denoting with pi, pi of t. Okay. Now, for pi of t, now uh, such that, uh, now this Lagrange multiplier itself only needs to be continuous on the time domain. Okay. Now, we define, we define a single scalar function as equal to summation over p of Lagrange multiplier multiplied by the constraint function alpha p. Okay? Alpha p equal to 0 denote the kinematic constraints. Now, the, once we define this capital C, the modified Hamiltonian principle the modified Hamiltonian principle involving the constraints is written as integral over the time domain of variation of the Lagrangian. Basically, remember that this t minus u is defined as the Lagrangian. Okay? So, variation of Lagrangian plus variation of this uh, function c, 
which is a summation of product of Lagrange multipliers multiplied by the constraint function minus summation of generalized forces multiplied by the variation in the generalized displacement qk is equal to 0. This will be the modified Hamiltonian principle and using this the governing equations can be written as so so even if you do not understand the theory uh, or what is being said the final equations uh, you can get your governing equations from here okay from here so what is it so this part is the same as earlier so this part over here what are these what is this this is the classical Lagrange equations okay so this is the classical classical Lagrange 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 equations okay plus now you have this term is coming from constraints okay this term is coming from from constraints so this is the constraint term equals to generalized force qk now when you are taking variation of c you can take variation with respect to pi and you can take variation with respect to alpha p means you can apply the product rule so when you take variation with respect to pi you get that the alpha means alpha j where j goes from 1 to capital P this also needs to be equal to 0 so these are basically the these are the constraints themselves these are the constraints okay now how many total equations are you getting over here what is the total number of algebraic differential equations that you are getting here all of them are it will be small n plus capital P that is the total number of equations that you are getting what are the total number of unknowns in this problem huh? what is the total number of unknowns n plus p yes. so that is also equal to n plus p so equations are n plus p what are the unknowns q k your generalized displacements how many are there small n of them are there and Lagrange multipliers pi p how many of them are there capital P of them are there ok. So this whatever I have put in the red box you can use this in order to get the governing equations for problems where you have constraints ok. Now there is one problem I am putting over here why do not you do it by yourself now. So what you have is there is a wire ok. Uh, which exists in xy plane this is x this is y equation of the wire is y equals to x square there is a bead which is which has a hole and it is sliding on this wire ok neglecting friction neglecting friction derive the equations of motion for this bead ok equation for equation of motion for the bead neglecting friction neglecting neglecting friction neglecting friction okay huh. so you please uh, do this by yourself okay 